Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Katie Weaver has a story on a recent Oscar nominee. Mario Ritter Jr. reports on animals seized from herders in Tanzania. Faith Perlo answers a question from a listener, and we listen to part four of *A Princess of Mars* by Edgar Rice Burroughs. But first, the actor Ki Hui Kwan. Has traveled an often changing path on his way to America's most important movie honors, the Academy Awards. The fifty-one-year-old was nominated for an Oscar for his performance in the twenty-twenty-two film *Everything, Everywhere, All at Once*. Few Oscar nominees this year have gone as far to reach the Academy Awards as Quan. Born in Vietnam, he and his family fled that country in 1978. They settled in California. As a child, he starred in two of the most popular films of the 1980s. Quan played the characters Short Round in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and Data in The Goonies. But after this early success, Quan struggled to find work as an adult. The film industry had few parts for Asian American actors. The actor went to film school. And later began working behind the camera. He left his dreams of acting in the past, mostly. But everything, everywhere, all at once, changed it all for Quan. The movie leads the 2023 Academy Awards race with 11 Oscar nominations. That includes the award for best picture. Quan is now living the dream he thought he had surrendered. The actor spoke recently with the Associated Press about the experience. When I heard the nomination, I jumped up and I screamed so loud. He said, "It just seemed so far fetched." Especially when I had to step away from acting for so many years, that dream seemed like it was dead. Quan was thankful for the support, but he had been afraid about returning to acting. The last time they saw me up on the screen, I was a little kid. Now I'm a middle-aged man, he said. Ever since our movie came out. They have shown me nothing but love and kindness," Quan said. "This has been a wild and unbelievable ride. I didn't expect any of this. The Academy Awards will take place in Hollywood, California, on March twelfth. I'm Katie Weaver. An American rights group says Tanzania is seizing animals from herders because it wants to bring more foreign visitors to the northern part of the country. The Oakland Institute, a research group based in Oakland, California, recently reported on the issue. The group said. Tanzanian officials are seizing the livestock of ethnic Maasai herders. The goal of the officials is to clear the area for increased tourism in the Ngorongoro 
conservation area. The rights group says the government forcibly seized 5,880 cattle and 767 goats and sheep from the Maasai people in November and December. Government officials are demanding that owners pay heavy fines. People who cannot pay have their livestock taken and sold to other people. Anurada Mittal is the executive director of the Oakland Institute, one group following the issue. She told the Associated Press that livestock is central to the Maasai culture and livelihoods. She said losing cattle is therefore catastrophic for them. With this new tactic, the government's goal is clearly to drive them away from their ancestral lands. The government says the relocation will increase safari tourism and the hunting of lions, elephants, and other big animals to pay for environmental and economic development. It says the displacement is voluntary and that the Maasai are semi-nomadic, meaning they are used to moving around a lot. Mittal said the government's statements are not true. She said officials continue to make tourism money more important than everything else, including lives. Rights groups have accused the government of denying the Maasai the use of health services, land, water, and salt licks, places where animals eat minerals. They say this is being done to force out the Maasai. The Ngorongoro Conservation Area is recognized by the United Nations as a UNESCO World Heritage Area. The Maasai villages occupy a small part known as the Loliando Commune. In June of last year, rights groups accused the Tanzanian government of using violence against the Maasai people. There was international criticism of the relocation program, but a court in the area ruled in favor of the government. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question about the difference between projection and prediction. Hello. This is Mohammed from Libya. I would like to know the difference between projection and prediction. How can I use them the right way? Thanks. Best regards, Mohammed. Dear Mohammed, thanks for writing to us. These two words are similar and are often used to describe guesses about the future but they have some interesting differences. Let's start with prediction. The word prediction is a noun, meaning a statement about what will happen in the future. Because people make predictions, they may or may not happen. Predictions are often made for the near future. We often use this word's verb form, predict, with events like the weather. For example, in the Science and Technology Report, Study, Exxon scientists predicted global warming since 1970s. The word prediction is used in the plural form to talk about the possibility of world temperature changes in the 1970s. 
A new study says scientists at the oil company Exxon Mobil made accurate predictions about global warming starting in the 1970s. A study by Harvard University researchers said that the predictions made by scientists in the 1970s became true. That means they believed something would happen in the future, and it happened that way. Not only scientists make predictions about the weather, groundhogs also make predictions. Groundhogs are large animals that live underground. On February 2nd in the United States, several groundhogs including Puxatawney Phil in the state of Pennsylvania and French Creek Freddy in West Virginia wake up and predict the weather for spring. The activities around these predictions are cultural traditions rather than real weather forecasts. The tradition goes like this. If the groundhogs see their shadows, meaning that it is a sunny day with no clouds, the prediction is there will be six more weeks of winter. If they do not see their shadows, meaning that it is cloudy and there is no sun, the groundhog's prediction is there will be an early spring. This year, Puxatawney Phil's prediction is that there will not be an early spring because he did see his shadow. Let's move on to projection. Projection is a noun. It has a similar meaning to prediction, something that might happen in the future. But projections can change depending on the situation or conditions. Projections are created based on numbers and facts. But if that information changes, it is understood that the projection changes too. Projections are often made for longer periods. For example, in 2019, projections for children finishing secondary education programs by 2030 were only at 60% worldwide. That was only if conditions stayed the same. Since COVID-19 affected children's education, that projection has probably changed. Here is another example. Recently, the United Nations reported a projection for the world's population increasing to 9.7 billion people by the year 2050. And here is one additional note. The word projection is often used to describe information in a form that can be seen, like a graph or chart. A prediction is a statement about the future, but unlike a projection, it is not easily changed if the underlying conditions change. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Mohammed. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. Hi, Faith. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me back. So, do you think Puxatawney Phil's prediction will be accurate this year? Well, I think Puxatawney Phil might be accurate. We just had a really bad cold front move in last night in upstate New York. It is actually negative 13 degrees Celsius right now. And it's only going to get colder. What do you think, Dan? I know that Washington, D.C., it's a little further south. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be six more weeks of winter this year, unfortunately. It's been a really warm winter. I'd like to see some snow. And the National Weather Service says Phil has been correct only 40% of the time in the last 10 years. 
It's probably good that we leave weather predictions to a groundhog just one day a year. And there's a lot more that goes into weather forecasts than seeing a shadow. That's a good point, Faith. One more question: Can't we project our feelings? What does that mean? Yes, we often project our feelings. A projection of our feelings is when we put the emotions we are feeling onto another person as their feelings. It's a way of denying how we feel, and then we blame others. Yeah, we're all guilty of doing that sometimes. Thanks for coming on the show, Faith. You're welcome. Hopefully, we can project good vibes onto that groundhog next year and get an early spring. The huge green warrior Tars Tarkas came slowly toward me with his thin sword. I backed away. I did not want to fight him. I did not wish his death. He had been as kind to me as a green Martian can be. As I stood watching him, a rifle fired in the distance. Then another. And another. Tars Tarkas and his warriors were under attack from another tribe of green warriors. Within seconds, a terrible battle raged. As I watched, three of the attackers fell on Tars Tarkas. He killed one, and was fighting with the other two when he slipped and fell. I ran to his aid, swinging my sword. He was on his feet. Shoulder to shoulder, we fought against the attackers. They finally withdrew after an hour of fierce fighting. John Carter, I think I understand the meaning of the word friend. You saved my life when I was about to take yours. From this day, you are no longer a captive among our people, but a leader and great warrior among us. There was a smile on his face. Once again, he took off a metal band from his arm, and gave it to me. I have a question for you, John Carter. I understand why you took the red woman with you. But why did Sola leave her people and go with you? She did not want to see me or the princess harmed. She does not like the great games held by your people, where captives are led to die. She knows if she is caught, she too will die in the games. She told me, she hates the games, because her mother. Died there. What? How could she know her mother? She told me her mother was killed in the games because she had hidden the egg that produced her. Her mother hid Sola among other children before she was captured. Sola said she was a kind woman, not like others of your tribe. Tars Tarkas grew angry as I was speaking, but I could see past his anger. I could see pain in his eyes. I immediately knew Sola's great secret. I have a question for you, Tars Tarkas. Did you know Sola's mother? Yes, and if I could have. I would have prevented her death. I know this story to be true. I have always known the woman who died in those games had a child. I never knew the child. I do now. Sola is also my child. For three days, we followed the trail left by the Princess Deja Torres, Sola, and poor ugly Wula. At last, we could see them in the distance, 
their animal could no longer be ridden. They were talking. When we came near, Wula turned to fight us. I slowly walked to him with my hand out. Sola was standing nearby. She was armed and prepared to fight. The princess was lying next to her feet. Sola, what is wrong with the princess? She has been crying much these past few days, John Carter. We believed you died so we could escape. The thought of your death was very heavy on this woman, my friend Deja Thoris. Come and tell her you are among the living. Perhaps that will stop her crying. I walked to where the princess Deja Thoris was lying on the ground. She looked at me with eyes that were red from crying. Princess, you are no longer in danger. Tars Tarkas has come with me as a friend. He and his warriors will help to see you safely home. And Sola, I would have you greet your father, Tars Tarkas, a great leader among your people. Your secret no longer means death to anyone. He already knows you are his daughter. The two of you have nothing to fear. Sola turned and looked at Tars Tarkas. She held out her hand. He took it. It was a new beginning for them. I know our world has never before seen anyone like you, John Carter. Can it be that all Earthmen are like you? I was alone, a stranger, hunted, threatened. Yet you would freely give your life to save me. You come to me now with a tribe of green warriors who offer their friendship. You are no longer a captive, but wear the medal of great rank among their people. No man has ever done this. Princess, I have done many strange things in my life, many things much smarter men would not have done. And now, before my courage fails, I would ask you to be mine in marriage. She smiled at me for a moment, and then her dark eyes flashed in the evening light. You have no need of your courage, John Carter, because you already knew the answer before you asked the question. Several days later, we reached the city of Helium. At first, the red men of Helium thought we were an attacking army. But they soon saw their princess. We were greeted with great joy. Tars Tarkas and his green warriors caused the greatest excitement. This huge group of green warriors entered the city as friends and allies. I soon met Tardos Mors, the grandfather of Deja Thoris. He tried several times to thank me for saving the life of the princess, but tears filled his eyes and he could not speak. For nine years, I served in the government and fought in the armies of Helium as a prince of the royal family. It was a happy time. The princess Deja Thoris and I were expecting a child. Then, one day, a soldier returned from a long flight. When he landed, he hurried to the great meeting room. 
Cardos Moors met with the soldier and reported that every creature on the planet had but three days to live. He said the great machines that produced the atmosphere on the planet had stopped producing oxygen. He said no one knew why this had happened, but there was nothing that could be done. The air grew thin within a day. Many people could do nothing but sleep. I watched as my princess was slowly dying. I had to try something. I could still move with great difficulty. I went to our airport and chose a fast aircraft. I flew as fast as I could to the building that produced the atmosphere of the planet. Workers were trying to enter. I tried to help. With a great effort, I opened a hole. I grew very weak. I asked one of the workers if he could start the engines. He said he would try. I fell asleep on the ground. It was dark when I opened my eyes again. My clothing felt stiff and strange. I sat up. I could see light from an opening. I walked outside. The land looked strange to me. I looked up to the sky and saw the red planet Mars. I was once again on Earth in the desert of Arizona. I cried out with deep emotion. Did the worker reach the machines to renew the atmosphere? Did the air reach the people of that planet in time to save them? Was my princess Deja Thoris alive, or did she lie cold in death? For ten years now, I have watched the night sky looking for an answer. I believe she and our child are waiting there for me. Something tells me that I shall soon know.